Today we'll be kicking things off with the latest Starship news. Then the lawyer wife is back to come on the show. We'll discuss the busy SpaceX launch schedule coming our way. Then finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin and this is SpaceX in the News. On Sunday evening, SpaceX fired up SN6 for the first time for a single static fire after a series of aborts earlier in the day. The test, however, was successful, and the mass simulator to be used during a later flight was mounted on top. That 150 meter hop is currently scheduled to happen on Sunday, so long as everything goes according to plan. But we'll see though, SpaceX has some Falcon 9 launches coming up that might interfere, we'll get to that later. This will be the first flight of this vehicle, and the first for the engine, SN29 as well. But third overall if you include last year's Starhopper flight, which happened almost exactly a year ago actually. The hydraulic rams that are used to simulate thrust during cryoproof testing was transported down Highway 4 this week and installed onto a new test stand. My educated guess is that it will be used to test the 7.1 prototank, a successor to SN7 that was the first to test the new 304L stainless steel, now being used on SN8 and subsequent Starships. 7.1, however, will not have the imperfection 7 did. Its single tank is being put together as we speak. SN5 came out of its cave this week, it was towed out of the mid-bay to possibly make room for SN9 stacking, which can't be too far off now. Despite so much going on with so many starships, new parts appear by the week. SN8's tanks are fully stacked. Britain here is looking forward to seeing it on display for October's starship presentation. Hopefully it's still around by then if you catch my drift. Because Elon said that by October, they might even have a prototype super heavy booster hopped by then. <laughs> That's great. They'll only need two engines to make it happen. Man, they're gonna be wasting no time making good use of that new high bay. Which is all grown up, and the thing is quite large. Think SpaceX will let me base jump off of it? You know, as like part of the presentation or something, give them a show. And as far as the Super Heavy's launch mount is concerned, I wasn't even aware there was a debate going on concerning what it really is. I guess some people thought it was a water tower. I gotta say, I'm disappointed. I thought we got past all that. But it doesn't really matter. Elon nipped the water tower speculation in the bud, again. SpaceX will use the mount they are building to occasionally fly Starship Super Heavy to orbit. Well, just Starship. Super Heavy will help get it there though. But once they move on to frequent daily flights, SpaceX will need to transition to a sea platform about 30 clicks off the coast because of the noise a few dozen Raptor engines will create on liftoff. But you know what? Be proud of yourself guys. Give yourselves a pat on the back. Despite your habit of thinking everything is a water tower, Elon still thinks your speculation is often accurate. And now it's time for your favorite segment of The Lawyer Wife. Hello, Kevin. <laughs> Over the past couple of episodes, I shared with you guys SpaceX's recent 40% award win with the United States military for the phase two contracts. And yet they're still complaining that they didn't win anything back in 2018 with the LSA awards. Thank you, Lawyer Wife, for coming on the show and not running over any pooches. I would only run you over and never my dogs. And I'm okay with that. So tell us what's going on. Why is SpaceX um, filing this or filed this? What do you call it? Um, a complaint. Complaint. That's the legal term. Is it le is it legitimate? Tell us what's going on here. Yeah, it's it's a legitimate complaint. It was actually filed back in May 2019 after Phase One, but it didn't really hit the news cycle again until right after SpaceX won phase two. But essentially what the what the complaint is alleging is that the government was unfair in the criteria that they used to evaluate the bids that came in under the LSA RFP, Request for Proposals. And that process is supposed to be a level playing field and the government, because they utilized unstated criteria to evaluate the bidders or at least SpaceX alone, um, it created an unfair advantage for the others and put SpaceX at a disadvantage. It's a legitimate complaint and it's very well written. So what criteria did the government state that needed to be passed by these bidders that SpaceX supposedly uh, didn't pass <laughs> or did pass but then got disqualified for passing? There were three main evaluation factors that the LSA requested or had that it that it stated it would use to evaluate the bids. Um, EELV approach, which is? The evolved 
Expendable launch vehicle, nailed it. <laughs> okay. Uh, the second evaluation factor was technical, which was split up into um, two factors. It was technical design and technical schedule. And then the third evaluation factor was investment cost. But the government stated that the EELV approach was the was more important was a more important factor than technical. So they kind of gave you a hierarchy of which factors mattered most. So these were what these were the strikes that SpaceX received. Well, so the government was utilizing these three evaluation factors, but within those three main factors, there were also like sub factors. And um, for example, for the EELV approach, you had to meet eight requirements. And if you want to look at them, they're in paragraph 41 of the complaint. Uh, but I'm sure nobody wants to. The problem is that the government then used unstated criteria when it said when it, it it provided its final evaluation to SpaceX as a high risk and it it kind of dinged SpaceX for like three weaknesses and all of them revolved around unstated criteria that was never listed in the original LSA and that's the problem that's very problematic because now you're utilizing factors that you never um, put forth in the original RFP. You're saying the government did what I do when we play board games? Exactly. Change the rules? Exactly. But you know, as long as I still win, who cares, right? I care. Um, so is that everything? You know, this channel is going to be the Lawyer Wife show pretty soon. I thought it already was. <laughs> All right, besides the SN6 hop, coming up we have not one, but two Falcon 9 launches. Starlink and Sabacom 1B on the same day? That would be the first. We'll see about that. It, yeah, don't forget to throw us in sixes flight somewhere in there too. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. It's too much fun for one day. You gotta spread it out. SpaceX also received their fourth lunar lander mission. Maston Space Systems selected SpaceX to take their Maston Mission One lander to the Moon South Pole in December of 2020. It's funded by NASA, who paid the company 76 million dollars to make it happen. Right, but now it's time for today's honorable mention. <laughs> Before we get into this, I just want you to keep in mind that I'm a biased person, all right? We all are. And the difference between me and your mainstream media news sources is that I don't pretend to be neutral. And yeah, sure, they're also way more successful than I am. <laughs> so in case you didn't know, this channel is pro SpaceX. Surprise! You know, that doesn't mean I won't call SpaceX out on any BS when I see it. Never be a blind faith sheep. But I'm not just pro SpaceX, I'm also pro Navy. My boy Dan Crenshaw, former Navy SEAL and Congressional Representative for Texas, 2nd District, Texas, has put forward legislation to instruct the Space Force to use Navy ranks and ditch those of the Air Force, or a modified version of the Chair Force. His tweet was in response to Captain Kirk himself, who wrote that he would like to see commanding officers on a Space Force ship use the rank of captain and not colonel. I mean, why not? Halo used naval insignia for its protagonist, and that game was awesome. You look nice. Thank you. A Space News article was written on the matter, and I don't think the author was necessarily a fan of the Republican or his Starfleet Amendment. At least that's how I read it. Writing that Crenshaw put the military branch in a political bind. So rude of him. The Space Force itself won't comment on the proposed legislation, but apparently, some secret sources inside the military branch view the prospect of using naval ranks as an insult that would permanently turn the service into a Star Trek punchline. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you're already there, space professionals. That's what they call themselves so they don't trigger anyone with spaceman. How weak. For perspective, the lowest ranking sailors in the Navy have been called seamen forever. Yeah, that was me, and the Navy spanked me around until they broke me. But you don't hear me complaining because I took the title as a compliment. I was a fast swimmer. The senior enlisted advisor of Space Force, Chief Master Sergeant Roger Tauberman, who wouldn't mind seeing his title reversed, said they will continue to use the Air Force rank structure until the legislative process is over. If it passes, they are ready to execute it. But this is where the article gets really good. 
Quote, critics of the Crenshaw Amendment who have posted comments on social media. Yeah, like we should all listen to the emotionally enlightened on Twitter because it's such a haven for reason. Said that if the Space Force were to adopt naval ranks, it should be done of its own accord and not imposed by Congress or celebrities. Because I know it sounds ridiculous to some on social media that elected officials should have final say on what the military does. Screw that, we want our military to do as they so please. Let them straight up go rogue. A superior article was written by military.com. The author here quoted the director of the Aerospace Security Project as saying, a good reason to use Navy ranks in the Space Force is to better distinguish personnel from Air Force personnel. Kind of like how the Navy's little sister, the Marines, use different ranks. But an even better argument, in my opinion, is that space is comparable to the sea with maritime laws. Quote, in maritime theory, navies exist in order to secure commerce, end quote. And as Elon Musk and other private companies expand our access to space and colonize it, it will start to look more like Christopher Columbus in 1492, sailing the ocean black. Listen, it's okay to disagree. It's not like it's that big of a deal. You would just be wrong. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. I want to thank my dedicated and oh-so-loyal eccentric members and patrons for continuously putting up with my shenanigans. If you'd like to put up with more of me too, check out the links in the description below. Y'all have a nominal weekend, and what, until Sunday? Godspeed.